What triggered um, the trigger for, for Biafra um, independence? I'm asking you to do a c c yeah. couple hundred years of, of uh, political yeah. science into a yeah. nutshell, but basically what was it that finally... I think lots of people would say different things, really. I mean, I think the trigger for the massive support within Biafra for independence was the massacres of Igbo people in the north. I think that's really the reason that people banded together and supported secession. Lots of people have said that the reason Biafra um, wanted independence was because the Biafran leader was horribly ambitious and you know that it was really about his ambition but then he had so much support among the educated class in Biafra and that's really because people felt that there was a strong anti Igbo sentiment that it was that they just could no longer feel safe in Nigeria as Nigerians. There's such enthusiasm for the cause. Mm -hmm. I think when one believes so strongly in something and when that faith is a result of fear, I mean, these people believed so much because they felt, you know, I've lost my cousins in the north, I've lost my brother, and, my, and, and this is one way where I will not lose anybody else, where I will be safe. And because of that, they believe so much in it. I mean, this sort of concept of the just cause, people like my father, who was, um, who was a university lecturer at the time, and his friends, they all believe, and these are people who are you know, who are intellectuals and who ask questions or who are not easily sort of swept off by things, you know. Intellectuals mm -hmm. had, rather than business people, mm -hmm. had put it together mm -hmm. and it just seemed well too good to be true. Yeah, I mean, in retrospect, of course, yes. But at the time, I don't think they... And, you know, when I think about it, Biafra might have survived, but then one shouldn't dwell on what is. I often think, well, <laughs> yes, maybe it was too good to be true. Where's your family now? I my parents are in Suka, which is the university town. Um, my sister and my brother live in Lagos. I have a sister who lives in the U.S. in Connecticut, and my brother lives in, in London. So you've, you've had a little family diaspora. Yes, yes. Just like the one in the book. <laughs> yes, well, I hope you're most not sleeping with your brother-in-law. You know, oh, that that got very confusing because everybody started sleeping with everybody else and. But, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you're writing a book about killing and, and war, and you sort of want to give the reader a break at some point and, and remind them that these are human beings who do things to each other. Um, but I in the middle of war, things get intense, you know? Yeah, but, but it would be, don't you think? I mean, I think that when people are confronted with mortality in that sort of way, and also I think that you have, you have very little to do. You can't go off to the theatre because there is no theatre then you might as well have sex and you know you then start to think about your neighbor hmm I would like to have sex with her and also I think that I just feel that sex is such a human thing and, and in this book I sort of wanted it to be a way in which people come together I mean Ola and Odeni will have a relationship that starts to get frayed at some point and and then for them in the way that I saw it sex then becomes a way of by watching how they do or don't have sex, we can tell so much about their relationship. And, and you know, my brother was conceived during the war. My brother who lives in England, so um. <laughs> he's going to be happy with that war intensity, if nothing else. <laughs> and he was born during the war, which wasn't um, easy for my mother. But oh, uh, I mean, considering the number of, of babies who died in Africa yes, in that period, yes. really, he's awfully lucky to be alive at all. He is, and I uh, yes, he is. My favorite character was the houseboy. <laughs> I, yeah, he was just so darn sweet. And was he? Was he sweet? He's 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 um yeah he's the he's the character that I most that was easiest to write. I think that I most identified with. But I didn't. It's interesting that he's. I did, I'm not sure about well sweet. I suppose in the beginning. Um. And did you want to smack me when you thought he'd died, and then it turned out he hadn't? <laughs> well, yes, I did. I did actually. It was like excellent. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, um, I remember my editor, my my um, British editor, Mitzi, suggesting. She said, "Oh, you know, we shouldn't do this," and it wasn't really. A, it wasn't sort of a, a technique. It wasn't an artistic thing. It was that many people in Biafra went through being told, "Oh, your son has died," and then months later having the son walk in. And I read about this over and over and heard stories about it. And I felt this has to go in the book. I want the reader to, I want to try and get the reader to feel that. Because I can't imagine what it must be like to mourn somebody 
and then to have them come back and, and it's you know lots of people <laughs> my father told me stories about people sort of running away when somebody would walk in because they'll think oh you're a ghost and that sort of thing and, and I just really think it must have been difficult the book is Half of a Yellow Sun a novel I've been speaking with the author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie eh? <laughs> Adichie and Half of the Yellow Sun, published by Kanata Canada.